a massive black cat. Very long in the leg, very muscular looking, round ears. The whole body language of the thing said, this is my road, I'm not moving for you. You say, well, I've seen this big cat. Some people just flatly refuse. They think that Britain's such a sweet little island, we shouldn't have predators that size. Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. Hello and welcome. This is episode 27 of Big Cat Conversations, coming to you in late June 2020. I hope everyone's doing okay, wherever you are, as we ease a bit out of lockdown here in Britain. Just this week in southwest England, we have heard direct about two different groups of people in different counties, both of whom were dog walking, and they were followed by big cats. One person heard puma-like sounds as they retreated close to the car when they were followed. The other witnesses were a couple who saw a very large black panther-like cat. It moved towards them, scared the dogs and followed them briefly as they retreated. They did consider taking a photo but quickly decided it wasn't a priority as they returned to their car. I have requested an interview with them so we may hear directly about that particular case in a coming episode. On to this show we have two guests. Our first in a moment is B from Dorset. She will describe a recent observation of a large cat high up a tree near the edge of her property. And our second guest is Scott Bainbridge, who is from New Zealand. He's an author, and he's just looked at the ongoing big cat mystery in New Zealand, and it makes up a chapter of his new book. So we'll get an overview of the big cat sightings in New Zealand from Scott a bit later on. But for now, over to our first guest. We're going to be talking about a cat up a tree, which is a rare event in sightings in Britain, oddly enough, as we're talking about leopard and leopard-like cats. And our guest is Bee, and Bee is originally from France, and she now lives in Dorset. And we're going to hear all about what happened in April 2020, when Bee and her husband noticed a big black cat up a tree near their house. So Bee, welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you for joining us, Bee. Before this happened, Bee, were you aware of big cat reports in Britain? I had heard that I think Exmoor's has got sightings of cats and Scotland, but certainly not here in Dorset or the south of England at all. And indeed, all over the place, actually, these days. You'd heard a bit about the tradition and the history, but you didn't think it might be on your doorstep. No, (laughs) absolutely not. Okay, so and so close to your house. So please tell us all about the sighting and how did you first notice it? A bit of um, a background. So I normally work full time away from home. And of course, since the lockdown, I'm working from home. And as you know, since the lockdown, the weather has been absolutely fabulous. My husband was furloughed. So whilst I was working indoors, he was working outdoors. And we used to have a quick lunch break outside during the sunshine, probably for half hour, then got back in and started clearing up. And whilst we were doing that, all the windows were open and my kitchen gave into the garden that gives into uh, the back where there's basically trees and like vegetation. And I noticed that the birds were making an awful lot of noise coming from the oak trees. There's quite a lot of big birds, you know, there's pigeons and seagulls, all, all sorts of different birds around and I just assume that the birds were either fighting each other or we also seen recently a very large bird of prey that has been coming quite close to this area and scaring the other birds so I just looked up thinking it probably was this bird of prey and at that point I realized that the noise was coming right across from our garden onto an oak tree and it seemed to be magpies making an awful lot of noise. And I just looked up and suddenly I saw really high up in the tree a rather large black cat, which seemed to be almost like lounging. It literally was on the tree, but not sitting or, or standing. It was just there. I looked and I thought, God, this is rather large. And then my thought as well was, oh, my God, this is a, a local cat that's stuck in that tree, probably. And I 
just made the comment to my husband, hey, you know, look, look at the size of this cat. And he just turned around and said, God, yes, that's a really big cat. And with that, the animal sort of stood up and jumped from the branch where it was, two branches down. And at that point, I noticed not only how big it was, but the movement and the way it jumped from branch to branch just didn't feel normal to me. It just felt like I was watching a, a wildlife program. And at that point, I said, it must have been, I need my camera. I need my camera. And I suddenly realized in the, in the back of the car when we go for walks. So I just reached out for my phone, which is the next best thing. And literally, I ran down the bottom of the garden, carry on looking. And the cat literally jumped, then stopped for like a split second. It spotted whatever it was looking for. And it ran across the branch wherever it was. There was a large, like a nest, probably the magpie's nest. It went for that, destroyed it, grabbed whatever was in there, and literally made its way down the branch. And then at one point, I saw it slightly climbing down the tree and jump. And that was it. The few things I noticed that really struck me the fact that it was black and a large cat, because it was so high up in the tree, it, it wasn't my first reaction to think it was anything unusual other than a large domestic cat. But really, when it started jumping from one branch to the other, I've never seen a domestic cat do that. And, and I don't think domestic cats are confident enough to do that, especially it was quite a, a tall tree. It's an oak tree. Um, it's not probably the, the the very, very old oak tree, but it's tall enough. I think it's probably about maybe 14 meters high. And I reckon the cat must have been at least 11 meters in the top branch where it was. And jumping two branches down just didn't feel normal to me and triggered the alert to reach for the for the phone or the camera. And then when it ran across the branch, I noticed another thing, the size just became even more apparent that it could not have been like a normal standard cat, let alone even, I was thinking even maybe a large Maine Coon, but they're fluffy. This wasn't like long furred. And then the tail was just huge. It was so long and curved. And the other thing I noticed when it came down, because it was like at an angle, uh, adding more towards us, so to speak, the ears were not what I call a cat. They were more rounded, a bit like a teddy bear type is. So all of that to me just didn't feel normal. And after it disappeared, I have to say, I felt really uneasy about it. I thought, this is not a normal cat. This is a very large animal that looks dangerous to me. And we are very close to a primary school. So my first thought was, oh, my God, this animal is so close to that primary school. OK, at the moment, there's no children in the, in the playground, but it's a very, very close to it. And my husband was the same. He, he could not believe the size of it and how we jumped. And of course, being two people seeing it at the same time, I think we, we noticed slightly different things. He told me that what he saw the most was the branches moving up and down when the animal jumped. That's what he noticed, indicating that the animal was of a, quite a big weight. I saw more the movement and the agility of the animal was incredible. I've never seen anything like this before. And Ricky, if, if I may say so, I mean, I know everybody has gone to a zoo. I've never been to Africa or somewhere very exotic where I can... I can refer in my mind, oh, I've seen a, a, a jaguar or I've seen a, a cheetah or a lion in real life. You know, mm. the nearest I've seen, I think last time I've seen a big cat was a tiger in a zoo. And of course, it wasn't the size of a tiger, of course, um, but nonetheless, <laughs> it was very big for a cat. Sure. No, that's a very, very helpful description of the form and the behaviour and the movement. And you've ticked a lot of boxes like the length of the tail and the, the shape of the ears. And how far away? This was a bit quite away from you, B, wasn't it? Yes, because we were inside the house and I ran for my phone. I ran 
to the bottom of my garden. And because I realized potentially this animal was something other than a domestic cat, I decided not to go across and open the gate. Mm. So I stayed inside the safety of my garden. And literally, I took the picture using the zoom in my phone to focus as much as I could where the animal was. I've got an iPhone. And when you take one picture, it physically takes about 10 or 12. Mm -hmm. So I was only able to take three pictures but these three pictures actually gave me probably about 30 different pictures of the animal you can literally pinpoint one picture by picture yes and you've got video as well haven't you yeah so the video clip is literally you can export with an application called lively uh, which is again is is an apple application i think it will literally turn your picture into a mini clip of maybe a second or two. Oh, okay. So it puts the photo burst together. Yes, it puts all these photos together into a mini clip. Okay. And that, again, you, you can slow it right down. So that's what I've done. I've, I've put it to the minimum speed so you can see the movement as best as possible. But obviously, it happened very, very fast. I mean, this animal, the way I felt was like, when it was at the top of the tree, it was looking for something. And the moment it, it spotted it, it went for it. You know when a cat hunts for or, or play with, with something, even if they catch a, a mice or something, they play with it. I've got cats, so I know what mm. they're like. These didn't play. They, there was no play in this. It was, I go for it, I've got it, and I run. It was predating and it, it might be worth looking at videos of leopards going for baboons in trees in Africa, for example. Do you know, that, that's a good point. And, and maybe compared to that, I mean, obviously, since the sighting, um, and as now, I, I suppose I, I find, you know, through Jonathan, I find yourself. Mm. It bothered me for a few days. I, I found it difficult. I could not sleep properly. I was really quite concerned. And then... I started looking online and I then found some articles that apparently there have been a lot of sighting in Dorset and really in the same town where I am, very, very close to my own house. And that's reassuring, perhaps, in some ways that uh, other people have seen it. We'll come on to that in, in a minute. Um, I just want to sort of finish off about the sighting. Well done for thinking about filming it, because you're probably aware that many witnesses just get so caught up in the wow factor and in the moment and really don't think to take a photo or, and to document it. But how long were you watching it before you decided, oh, I, I realised that a photograph or filming was worth it? Very quickly, I think my brain suddenly the alarm bells was ringing thinking this is not normal what you're watching is is unusual you need to record that i wonder whether you thought about that because you were in the safety and confines of your own house whereas if you'd been out in the open walking a dog or rambling or something it's um not quite the same do you think the fact that you were in your house and and you thought you were safe that played a part yeah you're probably right you're probably right um that said when we go for walks with my husband i usually take a camera with me because i, I like taking pictures of whatever you know whether it's a beautiful scenery or mm -hmm. you know rarely been able to to capture beautiful birds or things like that because it goes so quickly as you say it's, it's always very fast yeah and maybe to be honest, very quickly, I thought, I, I need to take a picture of this. Something is, is really odd here. And I just told my husband, carry on watching. Yeah. How difficult was it to film it well, do you think? Oh, very difficult because I was literally running with my phone in my hand, trying to, to open the app and get it to go mm. and try to zoom in at the same time. So, And I stopped at my gate and literally elevated my phone to be able to take the picture as high as I could because the animal was so high up in the tree. Yeah. How far away was it from you? Probably 20-odd metres. Okay. I've got a gate, literally a, a walkway, and behind that walkway there is like um, an area which is almost like in a triangular shape. There's a lot of very tall ferns growing there, and all along that area there's all sorts of trees. 
and this is one of the oak trees where the animal was. And I reckon it would have been maybe, yeah, 15, 20 metres. Right. And how long do you think this whole episode was when you noticed it and it went away? About 30 seconds, I think. Very quick. Okay. Very, very quick. Do you think it was deliberately there stalking for birds and birds' nests? Or do you think it was uh, yes. lazing about and then it just suddenly thought, hang on, there's some bird chicks here to raid? There are a lot of birds in the area, in the trees there. We've got a very tall pine tree, a Scott Pines, I think mm -hmm. it's called. There's still three along there. And an awful lot of birds are actually in that tree all the time. Uh, we've got the crows and all sorts of other birds. But that's even higher. This is really tall, that particular tree. Potentially, this animal knows it is a good feeding ground if they want a, a, a quick snack. Sorry to say. Yeah, sure. The size of it, I don't think it's going to feed him for very long. But I think it was a, an easy catch if that makes sense. Yeah. Have you ever seen your cat in that tree or any other domestic cats in that tree? And how do you think they would behave at that scale if they were up that high? Well, I can tell you because I've got a domestic cat. She's a British short head, so she's quite short-legged. Mm -hmm. And she got stuck in those trees twice in her life. Um, so I had to get the Arispecia the second time because she was very, very high up in one of the trees there. And trust me, she was not a happy cat. She was there for a day and a half uh, all night and pretty much most of the one day and half of the other day. And she was extremely shaken. She hasn't been near the tree since. But when I compare the behavior, my cat was completely, um, I mean, she obviously was able to climb and obviously probably was chasing the same thing this animal was, except she's not equipped to do that mm. because she could not come down. It was really difficult and she was really scared. And this animal wasn't scared. It was so, it was just so confident in the tree, mm. incredibly agile, um, swift, extremely swift. No, I've never seen anything like that. And you said it was like it was almost just walking down the trunk at times. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. In fact, in one of the little footing I've got, I can almost see it. It obviously has gobbled up whatever it found in the nest. And at one point, I can see in one of the pictures, you can see it's almost like cleaning his mouth with his paw. Okay. Wow. I haven't seen that. I've seen a couple of clips that you've sent, which are, are very good, very, very helpful. And um, as you know, I have sent them to two of my contacts, uh, leopard experts in South Africa. And both came back saying, this is very intriguing. This is a very wild, confident cat. We're not saying it's not a leopard, but we're not, we don't know enough and we haven't got long enough footage or close enough knowledge of the scale to say yeah. definitely. But they basically said, we're not saying it isn't a leopard. So, which I think is all you can expect from people overseas just seeing the footage only and not knowing the full story, which, but that's still interesting. And I mean, the problem is people like me are seen as biased, and obviously I've got to be aware of that. I try to undo my bias, but I do see a leopard-like form in that, in the tail and in the sort of shoulder area and the head area. And of course, they can come in different sizes, depending on male, female, age. But you tell us about how you worked out what you think the length of the body and the length of the tail is, B, please. Yeah, so it's what I was saying to you, because it was in the tree and so high up and moving fast, it's very, very difficult for me to be able to pinpoint to something, to measure it against. So what I've done, I've tried to go near that tree and I can't at the moment because there is too many high ferns and other vegetation there. And also, I'm going to be honest, I'm a little bit scared going there. Um mm just in case it's around again. Anyway, I borrowed my son's uh, two-meter level. He's a carpenter. And I literally took it with me near the area. The other oak tree that's behind our property is a little bit taller than the one where the cat was, but not majorly. So I took the level with me, knowing it's two meters high. And that particular tree has got a branch that, to me, is a very similar uh, shape and angle to where the cat was on its way down. Mm -hmm. 
And also, it has an area that is, in my opinion, very similar when I look at it in terms of the length where the animal was. So I took the level and literally, the best I could, obviously, measured up against the, the level. And it was just over half of the dimension of the level. And that's where I was thinking the animal in my mind probably is around a meter to 110. And that's head and body. Yes. I think the tail was, I reckon, 70 centimeters long. It just looks so long, that tail. On one of my little clips, I really can see the tail. When the cat's going down, it's quite amazing how much the tail moves up and down. And at one point, I can see the curve almost entirely across the body to the back of the neck of the animal. So it tells you how long it is. And how much it's using it for balance and manoeuvre. Yes. Absolutely. My, I know my cat could not do that. Was it um, entirely black bee? It looks that from the footage I've seen. Yes. So again, from the distance to me, it looked pure black. Yeah. You know, sometimes they, they are domestic cats which are black. They usually have a bit of white or under the neck or something. This was pure black. And I think, to be honest, what really got me is the ears. When it came down, the head, the ears went rounded and didn't seem to be like a normal cat i don't know it mm. seemed to me like the normal cat their ears maybe are more forward mm -hmm. yeah and and more proportionately big i mean they're not proportionally very big for a leopard yeah just to me it just felt so unusual to me it wasn't like a normal cat which is why i went to, to picture it yes and what about it was obviously on a mission and and not being deterred from predating the bird's nest and then moving away but was it aware of you or any other noises at all do you think and, and how was it dealing no. with the okay and how was it dealing with the mobbing birds oh completely ignored them i mean literally the poor i first sorry the poor birds i mean no matter how much noise they were making or there was one on one side of the tree which is one on one of the clips you can see on this the right hand side of the picture but the other bird was uh, closer to where the nest had been and it just had total disregard for <laughs> the boys they might as well not have been there quite honestly see i know i was in the inside of my garden so it probably wouldn't have been aware of me but i'm thinking if this animal it comes here on a regular basis it probably comes across people from time to time and it probably is aware that people are of no danger to it because that particular lane we have people walking their children every single morning and picking them up in the in the afternoon we also have dog walkers on that note you have discussed it with your neighbors haven't you and uh, can you tell us the different reactions you've had i know you've uh, some of them knew about it didn't they yeah so one of the neighbors said to me oh yes we've seen that big black cat it's been there this lady's lived here, I think, 30 odd years. And she said, yes, over the years, we've always seen big black cats round in those trees. They hunt for the birds. But my next door neighbor's daughter, who is a lady in her 60s, when I approached her about it, she basically said, oh, yeah, that big black cat thing. She said, oh, we know. She said, I've seen it a couple of times. She said, it, it's around. And she thinks sometimes it's in the ferns. And she completely wasn't phased by it because she said that they come from the Exmoors area and she think it's totally normal to have these big large cats <laughs> <laughs> which I was like okay okay maybe it's just me yeah you've also met skeptical neighbors haven't you as well so not neighbors but when it first happened I went back at my desk and I had a, a team meeting and we have a group chat on whatsapp and I send them the picture of it. I said, guys, look what I spotted at lunchtime. It's only a bit scary. And of course, they all laughed it off. So, yeah, I think people can be quite sceptical. And another group of friends that we have regular Zoom quiz and that kind of thing at the weekend at the moment, the same reaction. They were just like totally dismissive. So I've not mentioned it to anybody else, really. Yeah, to, to us big cat anoraks, that's a bit of gold dust you've got. Well, you know, it's interesting, but now I keep looking. 
and, and looking at the trees every so often thinking, oh, am I going to see it again one of these days? Yeah. And you and I have discussed a camera, and I think that, that in a way is why you need one of these trail cameras. Day or night time, it could be there and you could miss it, of course. And the difficulty you face with doing a really rigorous scaling, an exercise to rescale it, is the leaves on the trees. Because what we like to do is take a repeat picture and superimpose or overlay the two pictures the original picture yep. with the reshot picture and with the scale in it and you've got a scale reference and you can then yep. work out the original one so you can't do that really till december when the leaves are off the trees yes i think you're right but i'm quite determined that i will want to do that i will probably try to get my husband and my son to help me out to do that Also, one of my friends is a very enthusiastic uh, wildlife uh, person here in Dorset and goes to the New Forest and has a lot of these cameras for his own wildlife uh, hobby. And he will be coming this weekend to help me out, look out the area to see where I could have the camera. So I'll keep you posted. Very good, yes. I would suggest you do need two because they can be unreliable and it'd be nice to get it from different angles and the angles of the cameras probably need to capture it from different dimensions to get different heights and different Mm. perspectives and and different gaps through the vegetation, that sort of thing. So people who haven't had experience with trail cameras don't realise how very challenging it can be sometimes in certain situations. To see, I guess the difficulty as well is because it is quite a public area here. so. Anybody could find a camera and walk away with it. Yes, even though they'll be in your garden, but it's close to public area. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, maybe just use cable ties because then at least people, if they were going to swipe it, they, they'd have to have a knife on them or something to cut through a cable tie. Mm. Because sometimes if you put too big a lock on it or put them in a box, in a metal box, that shows them up. If people are determined, yes. they might still wrench it away. So to keep it camouflaged is probably... The first thing, anyway, yeah. Now, B, you said a few times that you were scared and a bit wary of it because of its size and its wildness and its behaviour. Now, if somebody said to you and your neighbours, right, we think there's a small female black leopard in the neighbourhood and maybe some um, in in the wider area, and we're going to eradicate them. Mm -hmm. We We know how to get rid of them. And we're going to make sure that there are no black leopards or black leopard-like cats or wild cats in the area. What would you think? Would you be happy with that or would you think, well, actually? No, no, I would not be happy with that because I guess my main thinking, you know, because it's been a little while now, we've had time to think about it. I think if the animal was seriously dangerous, we would know by now, Mm. I think. And also... I think, well, if the animal has been in the wild for quite a while and is able to survive and people seem to believe it doesn't exist, then it, it's of no consequence to humans to a point. So I guess what I'm saying is I would not want the animal to be armed at all. I would not see the point. I think, you know, if they've made their life here for whatever reason and whoever's release them or however it got here to me it doesn't the right to remain here and i think if anything we should protect it interesting yeah yeah i had a conversation with my brother in france who's very keen wildlife uh, person and he suggested that maybe we should even try to leave things for it to feed on so i, I would not go as far as that yeah. Yes, it, I doubt it needs that with so many rabbits and pheasants and deer around. Yeah, yeah. So, no, I wouldn't want it to be harmed at all. In fact, I think if we have got such big cats in this country, um, I think it's really vitally important we try to understand where they are, how they survive, and uh, find a way to even track them. Yes. And make it part of our day-to-day life and and accept them for what they are now yes you know yeah i don't know if you've heard many of the podcast episodes and i've read much of the literature as, as exists on the subject but what you've just expressed is quite a common view in fact of, of people who are seem to be aware of the cats obviously for the skeptics or people who are completely unaware they don't have a view and skeptics you know wouldn't go there because they feel 
we're all uh, misguided. <laughs> we're misciting things. So, but from people yeah, who yeah. Are, who accept the cats or know about them, your view is actually relatively common. Um, and people listening to this podcast, I'm sure, will um, recognise that. Yeah, and why should we want any harm to it? You know, I, I just think it's an animal. So why would we want to get rid of them or hurt them or put them in a cage? To me, they don't belong in a cage. Yeah, you know, if anything. Is their home now here? Yeah, sure. I think you're making very valid points, and and it's nice to play devil's advocate in a way to just to give other perspectives. What would you feel if you knew that it taken your domestic cat and it was sometimes preying on other people's domestic cats? Mm, I've thought about that to be honest, long and hard. Um, and and I have to say, in the evening, I'm quite nervous if I call my pet and she doesn't come straight back. Um, and, and I am concerned that potentially that could happen. Mm. Very recently around here, I've seen somebody advertising the fact they'd lost their lovely little bunny. And, and I'm thinking, well, it could be, it could be this animal or it, it could be a fox. We've yeah. got foxes along here. Do you know, I, I think, again, we have to accept that it is what it is. Uh, and if this animal is hunting, and it probably would catch a pet. I just hope it's not mine. Yes. I'd rather it catch you the magpies. Yeah, sure. And your point about tracking them and understanding them, uh, the part of the awareness would be knowing that there's a potential for your pets to be on the menu sometimes. So people can be informed and realise that at dawn or dusk, there is a potential risk. Yes. And that's where I guess a lot of the sceptics' attitude comes from, is to a point I expect is, denying that these animals are here is the easiest way to ignore the potential risk and the potential danger this animal would create. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's probably easier for people to think, oh, she's a loony. <laughs> she's making it up. Yes. But the thing is, I know what I saw, Rick. My husband was with me. As I said, we pinch ourselves sometime, but it was there. I, and I took the pictures We saw it in action, and it wasn't a normal cat as far as I'm concerned. It truly wasn't. Yeah, sure. Now, do you think there's been more than one in the neighbourhood? How confident are you that when you speak to these neighbours who are aware of it, have you asked them for their um, judgment of the scale and the form and everything? Do you think it was the same cat, or do you think they might have seen something slightly bigger or something different? Well, to be honest, Rick, at the moment, because with the lockdown, it's very difficult to speak to people and see people. Yeah. But I think when things relax a little bit more, um, I would like to have a conversation with the daughter of my next door neighbor, because she is the one that said she has seen it a few times now. Well, a few times, twice. And understand where she saw it and what it was doing and the kind of scale, because that would help me as well. So I will try to have that conversation with her in a few weeks, if it's possible. Yes, sure. I will let you know. Great. Okay. And do you judge that your neighbours are like you, wanting to keep it a little bit under the radar so there's not too much fuss and attention on the locality? Maybe. I think to her, um, very grounded kind of person, and she is... Uh, used to live in in the countryside and I think she probably think nothing of it because it's just another wild animal out out there Mm. but uh, as I said it wasn't a very long conversation so it's difficult for me to judge how much she saw of it but I really would like to have that conversation with her yes sure and and can we just get a bit of a picture of the neighborhood this isn't even the edge of the town we're into the residential part of the town yeah are you about a mile from the edge of town, are you? Well, let's put it this way. If I go out through the back gate, it takes me 15 minutes to get into town walking right in the town centre, 15 minutes. So I would say probably less than a mile. Yeah, but in terms of open woods and fields and nature reserves and river valleys, it's not like you're right adjacent to those, is it? No. So where we are, we've got that little bit of green area. Then. Outside of that, I would say probably two or three hundred yards probably from the edge of where I saw the cat. It leads you to a main road and past the main road is another wooded area, which is much larger. 
And again, there's a lot of trees there, pines and oaks, and probably very easy for the animal to hide. It's quite rocky and hilly, and it's always dark, even when it's sunny. It always feels quite dark there. Mm -hmm. And then we've got, not too far from that, I think we have got the park and the lakes. And there are a lot of geeses, ducks, swans. So I think if this animal at night was going there, it easily could feed itself very, very easily. So probably a large part of the territory of this animal, of this cat, is urban parkland, urban green corridors, not the open countryside. It's partly residential, at least, in its territory. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. And it's dodging dog walkers, it's going around school playing fields. Yeah. As you say, without people knowing and keeping people sceptical. Yeah, and it's black. So I don't want to be funny, but in the evening or and at night, nobody's going to notice the animal. Yeah, sure. It will hide very, very easily. Yes. Does it surprise you, B, that people in Britain don't see these cats up trees much, or if they do, not for very long? We've had one person on the podcast talk about one coming down from a tree and after the family dog flushed it up a tree. It is a surprise to me, as a person who researches and comments on the topic, that we don't get sort of dogs barking at the base of trees and people looking up and thinking, gosh, you know, there's a large cat that my dog has flushed up there or my dog's, you know, alerted or alarmed about something up a tree. It is a surprise to me that there aren't more witnesses of cats up trees. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, actually. But again, is the animal in the tree a lot of the time or only some of the time? Again, as, as the dog walker, let's say, or somebody who's going for a walk, how often do people look up a tree? I don't think we do. Yes, and if your dog was barking at the bottom, you might think it was barking at a squirrel and not bother to look up. Yes, and potentially the dog walker might tell the dog off and pull it away from the area. Yeah, without looking up. But yeah, and again, because you don't expect it, because you don't expect to see such a large cat in a tree, you would not be looking. The reason why we saw it is because of the noise from coming from the birds and quite honestly, I expected more to see, you know, other birds fighting among themselves or these prey bird that, funny enough, on the news a few days ago, they were saying, has been reported, um, it's actually a very large prey bird. It's not an eagle, but it's, it's a very large prey bird that apparently is currently nesting on the ruin of Corfe Castle. OK, probably for at least half the year the leaves on the trees are going to hide anything like that in a tree anyway. So you wouldn't see it. If it was up there now, for example, looking out of your house, you probably would hardly notice it, would you? I would not be able to see it. There is another tree in front of that oak tree where the animal was, which completely hide away the oak tree from view in terms of the branches, if you see what I mean. Whereas when I saw the animal, it was early April. So there was not too many leaves on the trees, so it was easy. We could see it well, fairly well. But at the moment, no, I can't see it at all. Yeah. Is there anything else you would like to say about the subject? You know, it's really opened my mind. I've been looking on various websites and I've ordered a couple of books to do some reading. And because I feel I need to understand what's out there, <laughs> just for my own benefit, if nothing else, mm -hmm. and, and understand what kind of behaviour and if there are any clues as well that we might be able to spot in the future. Yes. Yes, I will definitely put my rubber boots back on and try to go around the tree carefully, actually, because I don't really know what I'm looking at. So I want to be very careful. But it'd be interesting to see if there are any, I don't know, scratches or anything like this. Yes, the notch marks of its claws, if it's sort of digging in and making a notch mark with the claw, the sheath from the claw sometimes dislodges and comes out. Now, the sheath can be DNA'd. You can get a DNA result because that's effectively skin. It will give you an instant DNA result. Some signs of the cats can be difficult to get a DNA result from, like a dropping. Believe it or not, even with a fresh dropping, it can be difficult, and you can only sometimes get the content 
the prey species, so rabbit or deer might be the DNA result, but that's not the animal that did the dropping. It's what the animal that's in the dropping. Yeah. Yeah. So that it is a challenge to find the signs for actual evidence. But I suppose the other thing I would say, listening to you, B, is that um, do you think this new way of looking at nature and your garden and the outdoors now is exciting and interesting or is it a problem? Is it, is it more fascinating or more problematic for you? Oh, I think it's more fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And if in any way I could help to either prove that there is such animal out there for my own sanity, <laughs> as well as everybody else, we've seen them before. Um, absolutely. Yes. I think my husband, who is quite somebody who is very fit on the ground, you know, a spade is a spade, you know, black is black. Yeah. I think it's opened his mind. And he's the one saying, we need a camera. We need a camera. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, it's quite interesting, really interesting. But, of course, you are very much wanting to try and help get evidence for your own purposes and, and for wider awareness and not jump ahead too much on the implications because, as you've realised, it is awkward, isn't it? You could easily scare people, mm. even though perhaps we don't need to scare yes. people. There are many implications of this, so you have to go at it cautiously and carefully, as you, I think you're picking up. Yes, and as I say to you, Rick, I think because we're so close to town and very close to a school, it could scare people. Yeah. So I've got a couple of friends whose children go to that school. I absolutely not going to mention it to them because I think it'd be scaring them for nothing. Because quite honestly, if this animal is around, I mean, it's a few weeks ago now that we spotted it and we haven't seen it since. And I'm thinking it probably comes around every so often in the area, probably. But it's up in my mind. And, and I know next time I go for a walk in the countryside around here, um, you know, outside of town, uh, we love my camera already, even more so. Yes, I mean, it would be very intriguing to know what its territory is and how far out of town it goes um, and how, how many parks and churchyards and bits of wasteland it knows very well, <laughs> including the people who go in those places and it has to work around. Yes, interesting, definitely. B, that's been terrific to go through all of that with you and to know that you want to keep on the case and be vigilant and try and understand it more and hopefully film it more. Because I know you've, you've done a terrific job in, in getting a bit of footage of it straight away, which most people don't manage. So very well done for that. I want to thank you for permission to put one of the pictures on the website that is so useful and I know you've got various ones to choose. We're going to choose one that we think is as clear as possible and people have got to recognise that it's the perspective is difficult and the tree branches are, are difficult, but we're going to see it in as good a form as we can from amongst the photos you took. Absolutely, yeah. That'd be great. More than happy to do that. When people look at the photos... They've got to realise that you didn't see it really fully stretched out in side on very much. It's sort of at an angle and so it looks a bit scrunched up and hunched up. So you don't see the full yeah. stretched out scale of the cat in the footage, do you much? Yeah, that's correct. Although visually me and my husband saw it fairly stretched at times, which is why in my mind I had an idea of what sort of size I was looking at. Uh, the pictures is a bit deceiving because at one point you can almost see the animal. As I said, it was like rubbing his uh, mouth with one paw, but it's so quick. Yeah. And again, you can see the tail moving back and forth. That to me is quite intriguing. Yeah. And I think basically you wouldn't have been scared if, if a cat the size of your domestic cat was up that tree at that distance. It wouldn't have scared you, presumably. Oh, of course not. <laughs> Yeah. I would have been more scared that it not been able to come down and I would have to be calling the tree surgeon to get it down. <laughs> great. Yes. Yeah, splendid. Well, it's great you're going to put some trail cameras up. Good luck with that. We'll keep in touch. And again, thank you very much, B, for being part of the show. Yeah, you're welcome. Nice speaking to you. Our word of the week for this episode is arboreal. It has a Latin origin and it means relating to trees or tree dwelling. And of course we have the word arboretum for a botanical collection of trees. And the French word for tree is arbre 
which we should certainly mention, given we've just had our first French guest on the show, B. And B, please excuse my non-existent French pronunciation on that one. And of course, most cats are arboreal to a degree, with some being more at home and more confident in trees than others. Leopards and pumas, our main candidate large cats, are of course skilled tree climbers in their native countries. Leopards often do hoist carcasses in trees, but pumas aren't known to do that. And in our last episode with Angela, we were discussing the apparent low proportion of sightings of panthers and pumas up trees in Britain, and the same thought occurs now after we've heard this account from B, because it's very rare to hear of a cat actually stalking and foraging for prey in a tree. For a predator like a cat, trees give shelter, resting places, and of course great vantage spots for surveillance, and they are places to retreat to if there is a disturbance. The low reports of large cats in trees in Britain remains a puzzle, but we aren't really looking for big cats in trees, so would we really notice them much? And then there's the question of adaptation, and the thought that large cats here may not need to resort to trees much to evade scavengers like in their native countries, and they may not need to avoid disturbance so much. So perhaps they wouldn't use trees to the extent we might think. Anyway, we'll keep discussing these and related points through the podcasts and hopefully from future guests we'll get more examples of big cats using trees to help our thoughts. So that's our word of the week, arboreal. Okay, well for our next guest we welcome Scott Bainbridge from New Zealand and Scott is author of a new book, New Zealand Mysteries and Scott's forte is crime and missing persons and he's also written about in the new book UFO stories, ghost reports but also he's made room for a chapter on big cats and New Zealand has for a long time had a smattering of big cat reports so very nice that Scott could make room for that in his book and Scott thank you very much for joining us welcome to the show. Oh it's my pleasure and thank you very much for having me. We are going to quiz you on all the aspects of the big cat reports in New Zealand. It's a great opportunity to do so. And how much on the radar is it, Scott? Was it an obvious choice to include within the scope of a book on New Zealand mysteries? Oh, look, it definitely was. There have been a number of sightings over the years. But when I was asked to to write the uh, New Zealand Mysteries book, I was able to choose the mysteries that, that I could write about. And I recall about 10 years ago being contacted by Michael Williams, who wrote a very, very comprehensive book about big cats in Australia. He did a chapter on New Zealand and I'd written at that stage a book called Without Trace, which covered New Zealand's most famous missing person cases. And I covered the case of a tramper who disappeared in 1972 um, in Hefe Terrace, which is a you know heavily sort of wooded area. It's a national park. And I was asked then you know, whether or not Rosalind Tilbury was her name, whether Rosalind could have been attacked by a panther. And at that stage, it's something that I hadn't considered when I researched the book. And I know that Michael sort of wrote a little bit about that in his. And, and so when I came to do this book, it was an obvious choice to cover black cats or the big black cats that have been seen. There have, As I say, there have been a number of sightings over the last few years, and each sighting that's made public generate an awful lot of public interest. Yes, sure. And it's mainly in the South Island, I gather. Can you just give us a quick overview of the time period, the history of the reports and the geography? Is it mainly South Island? Yeah, the majority of them have been in the South Island. It stems way back to the beginning of the 20th century, there have been these odd sightings. So over the years, they've been sighted all around the South Island. And over the last 20 to 30 years, the area of sightings have been restricted to the South Canterbury area, which is in the middle of the South Island. And if listeners who enjoy the Lord of the Rings movies, Lord of the Rings was filmed in the South Island. So it's a very mountainous area. And certainly the plains between Canterbury on the east coast and the Alps on the west coast, there's thousands and thousands of acres of, you know, desolate farmland and forests and very sparsely populated. So, yes, I'm lucky enough to have toured uh, New Zealand many years ago, had three months there for work. And I remember the South Island, very diverse, very rugged and wild in parts. The impression you get is that any big cats in the middle parts and on the plains of the South Island, not many people would see them at all. It is very sparsely populated and they'd have the place to themselves. 
Oh, definitely. And you, you know, you can travel for miles and miles and not see anybody if you're traveling inland. It's quite feasible that wild animals such as these panthers can easily live and breed without being seen by um, anybody. And certainly the sightings over the years have been purely accidental. You know, yes. People have been driving along and they've stopped and all of a sudden they've seen these cats in the distance and the cats see them first and it's but the cats are so fast they sort of disappear before the people can get their cameras out so sure yeah much like here much like here in britain it's ongoing scott isn't it and it's been going on for decades hasn't it as far as i can tell it has it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly when or how these panthers came to be in new zealand there's stories circulating that in 1915 a ship with the circus panther, a pregnant circus panther, birthed at Littleton, which is one of the ports of the South Island, and the cage accidentally came open and the panther ran off into the foothills. The officials never did anything about it at the time because they figured that you know a panther like that couldn't survive a Canterbury winter because it gets way below zero degrees. In the years after that is when the panther sightings, a lot of them have been officially recorded. But what about trophy pets? Has there been any tradition of trophy pets of these cats in New Zealand? Well, when I started this particular chapter, I made inquiries, and I think there were, we were two recorded black panthers in private zoos in the country, as well as our main zoo, Auckland Zoo. Mm. But um, New Zealand's a sort of place where bringing in any exotic animal, it's pretty well regulated. I can probably hand on heart say that the panther that people are seeing over recent years isn't an escaped a private zoo or an escape pet. But I do believe that it may be the offspring of such an animal that may have come in years and years ago and it, and I guess over the years have bred with the, the wild feral cat population and has transmogrified into this large cat. I guess some of them, it's reasonable to say, would be missed sightings as well. So if some of them are plausible, then some of them will be missed sightings. Some of them could be very large ferals being reported faithfully by people, but they are simply very large ferals. I mean, that's the same in Britain and it's the same in Australia, it seems. In my book, I do have a photograph there of, of a dead feral cat lying beside a, a Labrador dog. And so the size comparison is pretty similar. However, the feral cat in the photo looks kind of like your large overfed you know, house cat. The difference between the sightings that, of the people that I've talked to, they are of the firm belief that it's not an oversized moggy. It is definitely a panther, and, and I've asked them to describe it to me. And I'm not just talking about one cat. I'm talking about sort of several sightings of different cats over a reasonably small part of the South Island, mm -hmm. but they're unanimous in saying that this cat is would be about the size of a large Labrador, slightly bigger. The head is more rounded and the ears are, are slightly rounded as well. But the thing that everybody agrees on is that the tail, the tail is a long tubular tail. It's not a fluffy thing, a long tubular tail. And that's what convinces these witnesses to say that it's not a cat, it's a panther or a, or a puma. Mm. And you can sense the consistency in those reports with those key characteristics. Yeah, yeah. And these people that I talk to are just everyday people. No one's got any reason to get in the limelight or make it up. These are very, very genuine people who are adamant they believe what they've seen and know the difference between a, a house cat or a large a wild feral cat and a panther. Again, very similar to the black panther type cats reported in Australia and in Britain. And as you probably know, the prime mm. candidate for the form and scale and size and tail description and ear description you've just gone through is the black leopard, the melanistic leopard, more so than the mm. jaguar. Yeah, I mean, it seems there is a very much a parallel situation, isn't there? Can I just go back to the origins quickly, Scott? Sure. One of the thoughts about origins of, of these cats where we seem to have them is that they could have been well they are, are reported in certainly in britain as being guarding animals you know and then the next notch up from a dog you know to guard scrap metal dealers sources and maybe mining claims it's a thought isn't it in the late 19th century mining was a huge business in new zealand and that is when we got an influx of prospectors from the USA and from China. These people came to New Zealand to stake their claims and our archive records are, are reasonably clear in that there's nowhere recorded that they brought in any wild animal. 
they could have been smuggled in. And these mining communities, it's a very sort of small area and there are a lot of people. So I'm sure that if there was a wildcat brought in to guard the mines, I'm sure it would have been reported about at the time. So it's not in the history books, as it were, that no. we know of. Okay. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that one report can often lead to another because people get more confident often if they hear of a report and think, oh, well, I may as well pipe up about my one. Since the book's come out, you've had a number of people come forward and give you further reports. Can you tell us a bit about that? that that's always very heartening, I think, when that sort of thing happens. It is. Um the people that I've talked to are generally people that have talked to the media about their sightings. So I'll go to them and, and ask them a, a first-hand question. And I find that they're a little bit more reluctant this time around because they've talked to the media and they've gotten a hard time from their friends or, or in the community that, you know, they're talking a lot of rubbish. Mm. So the attitudes there to a panther sighting, um, you know, people are quite fearful of coming forward. And I interviewed Angela Montgomery, who's a, a young lady who saw a panther walk past her gate one morning. She lives in, the, in a rural area. And it wasn't long after that that I was talking to a, a young guy who knows Angela. But he said the next week he was in the bush and he saw a panther and he believed that it was larger than his own Alsatian dog. And he was quite fearful. And he was quite pleased that his Alsatian dog wasn't in the bush with him at that time <laughs> because he believed that that cat would rip him apart. And I asked him, what, you know, oh, how come you didn't go to the media about it? And he said, look, I just don't want to get a hard time from people. He'd mentioned it to a few friends and, you know, they were giving him a stick about it. And this was a year and a half later. So there is that hesitation. There's also the response from authorities. See, over here in New Zealand, if somebody goes to the media over a sighting of a, of a big black cat, the authorities, Department of Conservation, who look after this side of things, they're very, very quick to dispel any sightings. They say, no, look, you're mistaken. It's just a wild feral cat. But they do follow up by setting traps in the area. Yet none of these traps have actually caught any of these cats. I guess they've got to cover their bases. If a panther did appear and, and cause some damage, then it's going to come back upon them. There's been only a couple of instances where livestock have been ripped apart by a wild animal. So there was a sighting in 2006 of a black panther and the farmer's wife who looked out the window and saw one of the kids' pet lambs being hauled away by a panther and she's left in no uncertain terms as definitely a panther. The attack on domestic animals um, or even livestock is very, very rare. So I think that may be another reason why the authorities don't want to invest too much time or resource to, to trap some of these large cats. That is good if they are there and they're not creating a stock killing problem. But again, that, that's actually true to form, really, in their native countries and largely in, in Britain. We'll come on to their prey items in a minute. Could we just have one sure. more example Scott, of a, a witness report you've had direct, could you relay one? Yeah, yeah. What was really interesting was that when my book was released, the, our national newspaper covered an abridged version of the chapter about the Panthers. It is regarded as probably one of the most high-profile mysteries, and it was interesting to read people's comments. You know, there were 12,000 comments within the space of two days. 50% of people would say, well, actually, no, people down there don't know what they're talking about. They don't know the difference between a, a wild cat and a panther. We don't have any of those sort of animals <laughs> in New Zealand. But there's equally another high amount of people that say, hey, look, it is definite. We have seen it ourselves. We haven't said anything because of the response we're going to get from people. And I've certainly had, over the last week or so, I've had emails from at least half a dozen people, some very well-respected members of the community, like there's a retired doctor who's emailed me and said, look, I have seen, it is definitely a panther that I've seen. It's not a, a wild cat. As I say, the reason why they only get coverage is when people are, I guess, brave enough to come forward to tell the media and the authorities. I'm getting the impression that the majority of people will just prefer to keep it to themselves because they don't want to be given a hard time. Public sightings are reported by tourists, you know, who happen to be driving along and they see something on the side of the road and they very quickly try and snap a photograph. And of course, with the photographs against the backdrop of the landscape, it's difficult to determine the actual size or the scale of it. There are equally a number of people like Angela Montgomery, for instance, who her partner is a sheer milker on a farm in, in Eiffelton, which is in the South Canterbury Plains. 
And she came out one morning to have a, a cup of coffee on her deck and saw this panther walk past her house and then it sort of ran off into the trees. And it's usually encounters like that. A lot of those local sightings are from in the rural communities. Are they always black? Do you, you don't have the mountain lion, the puma, the sandy brown one reported as well? Yeah, there was a, a reporting made in the early 2000s by a tourist who saw two tanned-coloured wild cats they described as being mountain lions. Two cougars of tan colour. That was most unusual because a lot of the previous witnesses have only ever seen one cat. And I'm not saying that it's the same cat, mm. but um, they've usually have only seen instances of one cat, whereas here we have two, and two of being a very different colour. Nobody's ever reported mother and cubs, as far as you know? Not as far as I know, no. No. I imagine the sample size makes it very difficult for somebody like you to make an overview statement or conclusion. But it sounds like, Scott, you're coming to the conclusion that it's reasonable to consider that there's a a small breeding population. These are animals that are breeding on because they've grown up here. They're not just a vagrant cat that's been released within the last 10 or 15 years that's still living. You're exactly right there. And The Listener, which is a popular magazine here, did an article about wild animals a couple of years ago, and they quoted that there were millions of wild feral cats who live and breed along the Ashburton River, which is you know near the South Canterbury area and in the plains. And cat experts I've talked to said they can interbreed, you know, the wild cats and the panthers. And over the course of generations, you're going to get something extremely large, more larger than a feral cat. That remains a controversial subject, but people have divided opinions on that. I think until we have perhaps more and better evidence yeah. and more bodies and more primary evidence, you know, we won't sort of know the full picture on that. I'm open-minded and I have seen, certainly in Britain, I've seen you know, a big, heavy, bigger than a dog fox size cat cradled in a deer stalker's arms on, on a mobile phone photo. And that to me yeah. looks like something weird and in between or a mutant feral cat, perfectly capable of predating a young deer. Yeah, so that cues us on to the penultimate item I was going to ask you about, which is the prey item. So th- there are introduced deer, aren't there, in the South Island of, of several species. Do you think deer is on the menu? We've even got wild wallabies as well. And it's funny that not many people in New Zealand realise that, that we have quite a, a widespread wallaby population in the South Island that would make ideal prey for a panther or a puma. But yes, yeah, certainly deer is widespread. Wild goats... Um, oversized pigs, wild pigs, they're just absolutely everywhere in the bush. Good rabbit population in many places? Oh yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. Well, there we are. I mean, it seems there's a ready larder of different sized mammals for an apex predator like that. It is good that there aren't stock kills, routine stock kills. Are there ever compelling photos of filleted out deer or sheep carcasses that people point to as a potential cat kill? No, I haven't seen any. And I've certainly made the official request to the authorities like the Department of Conservation and Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries to see any evidence of any kills from large cats, but they're very reticent and very reluctant to give me any information, so I can't really form an opinion. The suspicious part of me believes that, (laughs) yep, the authorities do know that these wild cats are out there. There's also, people are pretty private. And if they reported, farmer reported a dead cow or another part of the livestock, they're probably unlikely to go and want to make a big scene about it because of the publicity it's going to encourage. The rebound effect is going to be too awkward. Probably easier just to just stay quiet about it and yeah. get on with things. I think that's the same the world over on this subject. I think so, yeah. I certainly do hope that, um, I mean, I would like to see, certainly in New Zealand, I certainly would like to see more of an effort made to try and track these large cats down. The thing that sticks out for me the most about talking to the the young guy who saw the cat in the bush is that once it saw him, it just shot off like it was like a bullet. So they must be incredibly fast. It's going to make them difficult to catch. It's flight more than fight, which you get from these kinds of cats. You know, they don't want to risk injury. They don't want to be bothered with an awkward human. Well, finally, can we come on to attitudes and, and two types of attitudes? I mean, the, the general attitude I think you've referred to in the media and the general population is some people are very scoffing and sceptical and others believe it because they've seen them or know people or believe friends and family who have done. So I guess there's that mm. part of the attitudes. But is there any trend in attitudes you pick up from reading about reports or having witness reports direct to yourself? 
The people that I've talked to that have witnessed these Panthers, they've always been very sceptical until they've actually seen it. Yeah. But they've been very hesitant now to talk about it. But do you get people saying, leave them alone? You know, I've seen one. Do you get people sort of taking pity on them? Or do you get people saying, it was really scary and I think something should be done about it? Is there any kind of emotional response that there's a trend of at all that you're picking up? Yeah, well, definitely in the rural community with the sightings that have been seen, a lot of the comments made are, well, you know, why don't we get a posse together and hunt one down? You know, there's very much an interest there from the public to actively try and do something to find these animals. I haven't heard of any of the animal rights groups or anything advocating for them to be left alone. There's a a genuine fear with some of the people that have seen these panthers. They develop a type of fear that, well, these cats could actually do some damage to, you know, young children. So it does prompt a little bit of fear in, in small communities. Yeah, that's interesting. A good proportion of people in Britain are saying, you know, if there were going to be problems, we'd have experienced them by now. And these animals do keep to themselves. You know, it's their natural behaviour in their native countries to be shy and wary of humans. So it may be that, again, the sample size isn't quite big enough in New Zealand. And also that um, Mm. it's not sort of revealed enough. As you say, a lot of people just don't reveal their stories. Yeah, yeah. There are an awful lot more sightings that than what we know from the media. I mean, I've focused mainly on sightings that have been reported and contacted a lot of those people. But yeah, if if people sort of keep it to themselves, it's difficult to know exactly how many there are. And what the behaviour of the reported cat is as well. Well, that's all very good. Thank you very much, Scott. On our website, I'm going to put a couple of clips for people to follow up under this episode and the references and links for this episode. One of the things I'm going to put is a clip from two guys in a truck, a utility truck in the snow in 2011 that filmed one. It's ambiguous. It looks to me like it's potentially a very large Maine Coon type cat. It's certainly not a a large black leopard or a mountain lion, puma, cougar type cat, but it's, it makes you think, you think, oh, that's a 50-50 one. It is quite big actually, but have you seen that one? So it's an intriguing mm. bit of footage and, and the expletives are very funny. They're obviously astonished and it's a nice watch anyway. You know that one, do you? You can hear it in their voices, can't you? That um, they're shocked. I'm on board with their view that it is what they think it is. Yeah, we'll put a link to that one on the website. So that's good. And also a recent report in South Island that was featured on one of your news programmes. A bit of clip of a couple who saw one run across the road and hear from a witness direct. Yeah. I had a talk to my publisher and They've suggested if any of your listeners want to purchase the book, they can do it via my publisher. Yeah. And that's just Bateman Books. So that's B-A-T-E-M-A-N Books. So batemanbooks.co.nz. We'll put a link to that on the website as well. Also, if people do Google Scott Bainbridge, they'll find links to your work, won't they? They will, and my contact address there too. Well, Scott, good luck with the book and good luck with your future work. If anybody is a witness uh, now or in the future and wants to come on the show, it would be great to hear from people from New Zealand. So do contact me if you'd like to. I'm very grateful for you taking us through the New Zealand situation. It's a lovely bonus for us and a great excuse to explore the big cat scene beyond Britain. I know it's not your lead subject, but you've dealt with it very helpfully for us. So, Scott, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show. Oh, look, I say thank you very much for the opportunity to tell my story up the Northern Hemisphere. So thank you very much. Before we sign off, there's one more website link from New Zealand to mention, and it's a documentary from 2007 with a wonderful title of Prince of Darkness. The Prince bit is spelt as in poor prince, and I wish I'd thought of that title for my book. It's a 25-minute, very watchable documentary about the South Island's panther and puma sightings, and it's packed with interesting interviews and examples, and it's even got one scaled photograph to look at. Back to our first guest, B. We'll do a quick update once the scaling exercise is done in the winter when the leaves are down in the trees there. The photo on our website is the one when the cat was head down eating whatever it had gone for in that tree. And then there's a very short video snippet of the cat moving off from there. So those and the New Zealand links are all under episode 27 of the Refs and Links page on the Big Cat Conversations website. For our next episode, we have two guests. One of the guests will explain his action of actually shooting a cat many years ago. 
and he'll also discuss how these days he has great interest in the topic and his priority would be to film one. I realise that won't be to everyone's liking, but his views, even if you disagree, are thoughtful and are much more involved than you might imagine. Meanwhile, from Australia, episode 4 of Missing Panther podcast has just been released. The episode is called The Fugitives. If you don't yet know Missing Panther, it really is a great listen. Righto, that's it for this episode. Thanks again to both our guests, B and Scott. Thank you everyone for listening, and we appreciate the recent kind comments on the Apple Podcast reviews. Please take care. Until next time, all the best. <laughs>